Welcome everybody. And um, I wanted to show you my co-presenters today. That's Frank right here. And that, sorry, this is George and that's Frank. So I know we all are pet lovers and everything else. I noticed some very interesting names. So in the Q and A box, could you guys let me know, sorry about advancing that screen. Could you guys let me know where you're from? Just, uh, and I'll start talking and then we'll go back and welcome everybody. So if you go to the Q&A, just type in where, where are you from and we'll get a good idea. And maybe even if you have dogs and or cats. So we're gonna primarily be talking about dogs and cats today. So, oh, South Africa, Yvonne, my daughter lives in Cape Town and I just got back from there uh, back in August. So, oh my goodness, that was such a lovely trip. And we've got Netherlands and Astrid has a cat. So you're not quite a crazy cat person yet if you only have one, but that's okay. Uh, and so we're gonna get started and talking about oral pain, toothaches and oral pain, and what we can do when our pets do have oral pain. So a big part of this help is gonna come from your veterinary team. Because as we look at pets, we have a lot of problems with them. In fact, some of the most common problems we see are periodontal disease, both in cats and dogs. Dogs tend to be a little bit more frequently seen uh, than cats for broken teeth or worn teeth. And when those are broken and worn, we'll talk about what we need to do. And certainly if there's any major trauma, say to the jaws or whatnot, that can be pretty, pretty tough as well. We also, both in some young dogs, but mainly in older dogs and cats, oral tumors can be a really big issue. So identifying those earlier are important. And sometimes we even see malocclusions, again, a little more often in dogs, and sometimes we'll do some intervention. And I put orthodontics, but really not a lot of buttons and elastics. We usually do things just to relieve pain. Cats, in addition to periodontal disease, have some really special issues with their teeth. I think they try to invent ways of getting rid of their teeth. And one of these is called tooth resorption. We'll cover that. Also stomatitis. And then certainly we can also have trauma, especially if they're outside. And as they get older, we can see tumors. So what exactly is periodontal disease? And there may be some out there who have a really good understanding behind this. And we may have heard about gingivitis and plaque on TV or whatnot, or when we go to our dentist. So plaque consists of bacteria on the tooth surface. And when we don't brush and keep these teeth clean, that plaque remains. And periodontal disease is actually the infection caused by this, these bacteria, but also the inflammation, some of it from the host itself, from the patient themselves. So this includes gum tissue, which gives us gingivitis, it includes a bony socket. And if we have a lot of periodontal disease there, we can lose bone that's shown on the right side of this picture. There's even a ligament in between the bone and the tooth that helps keep it in place. It's very important for keeping this tooth healthy. And this periodontal ligament, we'll talk about that later. The thing of it is, if we don't do something to interfere with the accumulation of plaque and calculus or the inflammation, it can progress and we end up losing teeth. So dental disease is very common in dogs and very common in senior dogs. In fact, any dog over two years of age, they talk about a 75 to 80% incidence of some level of periodontal disease. This of course increases as pet gets old, pets get older. I have a great interest in our senior pets. And it also has an increased incidence in smaller dogs. So when we start looking at these smaller dogs that tend to live longer, they have less bone, they are really at risk, at risk for periodontal disease. And then certainly with our seniors too, the, the tumors and things like that as well. So what do we look for for periodontal disease? Now, a lot of people will say that bad breath, that halitosis, that mallow odor, which is the infection and even certain bacteria that produces sulfur. It could be that they're not eating hard food anymore, that they're wanting soft food or certain treats they're not doing or not even eating well. And there can even be bad weight loss if it's that bad. However, your pet may show nothing. In fact, periodontal disease as it's progressing is a silent disease. Since it's kind of slow, 
it usually isn't acutely painful until later in the disease if we have a, a mobile tooth or a lot of bad bony infection. So we're talking about a lot of hidden problems. And that's why it's so important to work with your veterinary team to make sure we keep these mouths happy. So initially we talked about bacteria and plaque and food accumulating on the tooth surface. When we brush two to three, three times a day, we're brushing off that soft plaque and hopefully we're brushing it off well enough because if it remains on the tooth surface, minerals from the saliva turn this soft plaque into tartar or calculus, and that can't be brushed off. Now, in fact, tartar doesn't cause as much inflammation or elicit as much inflammation as that soft plaque does with the bacteria. So it's somewhat inert, but it's a rough surface, so more plaque can form and then more tartar or calculus and more plaque and more tartar and can really build up. Kind of like a pearl, just not quite as pretty. So when we see this accumulation of the tartar and plaque, it's the primary bacteria that causes the infection and can cause gum loss and bone loss. And so that's an important reason why we brush teeth to get rid of that soft plaque and get rid of as much bacteria as we can. But in fact, the body's own immune system can destroy its own tissues when it's fighting the bacteria. And some of those immune systems, so white blood cells, certain enzymes can end up destroying some of the tissues along with the tissues that the bacteria destroy. So here we see a picture of a dog's um, upper right jaw with the upper big upper fourth premolar in the middle. And we see adjacent teeth that even have more bone loss. And when we start seeing this kind of inflammation, infection and bone loss, the teeth are at risk, but it's not the only thing that matters. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. As we are evaluating periodontal disease in the practice, certainly we can look at this dog and say, man, there's a lot of calculus there. There's even some grass and who knows what else is up there. I've even found kitty litter up in the plaque and tartar before. But it's not just the amount of tartar and plaque, it's actually how much tissue is lost. So we go from stage one to stage four. Stage one, obviously we hardly have any attachment loss. We do good brushing, we do good home care, we do regular cleanings and we can keep these teeth healthy. Once we start getting that bone loss and gum loss, it's pretty much irreversible without special procedures. And when we get to greater than 50% bone loss in stage four periodontal disease, that's when the teeth are definitely at risk. In fact, sometimes we can have so much bone loss, particularly in small dogs, particularly with these lower jaws, that it can cause a pathologic fracture at the site of the bone loss. So this is a lower first molar on a left mandible, lower jaw. And it had such bad bone loss that when a small amount of trauma, whether it's jumping off the bed and hitting their chin, sometimes getting jumped on by a big dog, things like that, it can literally break the jaw if we allow the bone loss to continue. And this is the most common place for it to happen. The thing of it is, once we have that fracture, in a place with infected bone, it's very difficult to repair. It's just not about teeth and bone though. The fact is the infection and inflammation in the mouth can impact every single organ of the body. We have some direct correlation specifically in human medicine about the heart and valve disease, about kidney disease, liver disease. And we have some studies in animals as well. So that dirty mouth can impact your pet's overall health. In addition, there's a term now that's becoming popular in human dentistry medicine, and we're starting to look at it in animals. It's not just the infection, it's not just the bone loss. It's not just bacteria getting the bloodstream, but it's that chronic inflammation that can impact organs and also impact the aging process. So it's a term called inflammaging. So it's good to get that inflammation under control whenever possible. Because with very few exceptions, periodontal disease is preventable. 
If you get early dental care, exams on a regular basis, particularly on small dogs, looking at brachycephalic breeds such as boxers, they tend boxers and bulldogs and French bulldogs and everything else, they tend to have crowded teeth and more issues with their teeth. And then any patients that have cardiac or uh, diabetic diseases, they need to keep a healthy mouth because we know there are specific correlations between cardiac disease and, and periodontal disease. Periodontal disease and diabetes actually help each other. So let's keep these teeth healthy. If we do have early, early forms of periodontal disease, young dogs may have minimal changes. And then we're certainly gonna look at if there's only small amounts of bone loss, do we try to clean them real good? Or do we sometimes look at saving the more important teeth? So we really like canine teeth. We really like the chewing teeth, what we call the carnasal teeth. Even with some more advanced stage three periodontal disease, we can even build back bone. So remember the jaw that was broken because there was such bad bone loss? Well, think of this x-ray of this mandible as one or two stages before that mouth. So yes, we've got periodontal bone loss. We've got infection in there. In fact, we have, we have an infection on the, on the two teeth conjoined. We can actually go in there, remove the source of bacteria, remove all the debris, all the infected material, and even use bone graft material to build that back up and to keep the jaw stronger. So again, it's preventable, but even if we get to more advanced cases, we can make a difference even in those patients as well. So here's a, that uh, post-operative picture of this tooth where we're replacing some bone graft material. We also extracted the tooth in front of this lower first molar because you can see how big that lower first molar is. That's one of our important teeth. Yes, all teeth are important. Some teeth are more important than others. And we see day after day how much treating the periodontal disease benefits the patient. I don't know if you've ever had one of those cases where you may have been a little bit anxious about taking your pet in for the dental cleaning and extraction, a little concerned about all the extractions, but once we get that infection out, once we decrease that inflammation, the entire body often responds. We get them in on their two-week visit, and so often we hear, oh my goodness, I didn't realize how bad the teeth were. He's like a new puppy. In addition to periodontal disease, one thing we watch out for and we see on a regular basis are fractured or broken teeth. Probably the most common tooth we see broken is the upper fourth premolar. And here's a picture of the right upper fourth premolar with something that we call a slab fracture. And that tooth was fractured so long ago, it already has calculus inside the fractured tooth. The little red spot is what we call granulation tissue and, or infected tissue. And the thing of it is, once we have the pulp and the nerve exposed or compromised, if we see gray or purple teeth where the pulp is dead, then we need to either extract the tooth or do a root canal. There's no other option. This dog may not be showing any problems. He might be uncomfortable with that slab fracture moving around when he tries to chew. He might be trying to chew on the other side. There may be no abscess that we see underneath the eye draining. But this source of chronic inflammation and infection can really impact the overall health of this pa patient. We also mentioned oral tumors. Oral tumors can be quite challenging because unless they're right up front in their early, uh, detected early, and in fact, it's a larger patient where we can take out the entire thing plus margins around it. These can be extremely challenging. Often these aren't detected early because they're hidden. I mean, think about this tumor at the back of the mouth. It got fairly big before it was noticed and it was finally noticed when the oral odor and bleeding and they took the dog into the veterinarian and it's already pretty bad. Now with regular oral exams, with doing regular home care, you might be able to find a small change early enough that if we do the diagnostics, find out what it is, we might have a chance to do something. 
there's even some benign masses in the oral cavity. And if that occurs, then even with some pretty good chunks of jaw taken out, we can make a big difference. Most times with most oral tumors, surgery is the first line of defense. There are some that we can consider radiation therapy and chemotherapy or combinations. I'll be honest with you, when I'm discussing oral tumors with a pet owner, um, surgery itself, dogs usually do really good, cats pretty good, depending on how large it is. Yes, we can do surgery and radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And there's a lot of nice protocols that can be done. But sometimes we have to look at what's best for the pet, what's best for the family, what should be done versus what can be done. Let's focus a little bit on cats now, uh, since of course you saw mine and I saw that a couple of people have some cats out there. So cats do have periodontal disease. We don't tend to see the incidence as great as in dogs and the progression. Sometimes I can see a lot of tartar and calculus and hardly any inflammation, or I can see minimal tartar and calculus and a lot of inflammation and ulceration. So cats like to do things differently. This cat has some periodontal disease on the upper fourth premolar, and basically it was severe enough that we extracted it, but luckily every everything healed and she did great. Other cats though may have something we call stomatitis. And stomatitis is almost like a bad allergic reaction. Remember, we talked about the host response to periodontal disease, destroying some tissues and causing inflammation. Well, these cats, and we see it in some dogs, go overboard. Minimal amounts of plaque and tartar, yet their inflammatory response is tremendous. It's excessive. They get ulcerations. And if I ever start to see any of this inflammation in the back of the mouth, that's what we're looking at back here, then I will use the term stomatitis. And I will usually recommend full mouth extractions because the cats are usually very uncomfortable and we want to get those teeth out before things are severe. If your cat has had some stomatitis, Early on, they probably respond well to antibiotics and cortisone injections, corticosteroids. And this makes them feel a lot better because cortisone decreases the immune system and stops some of that inflammation. But they'll need it again. And soon they aren't working as well. And even though cats can handle cortisone better than humans and dogs, you can still lead them into diabetes and other diseases. So cortisone is a good treatment at times, but it's not a long-term therapy except for certain conditions. Another special thing cats do, we see it in dogs, but not nearly at the incidence that we see in cats, something called tooth resorption. So for some reason, um, either with stomatitis and some other things, I think cats just don't like their teeth. They try to get rid of them. So what happens here in the diagram and in the x-ray below, the best, and we don't know exactly what causes it, but for some reason, bone cells get past that protecting periodontal ligament in between tooth and bone. And then they start resorbing the root, start transforming the root cells, the dentin, the cementum into bone. So we call, also call this replacement resorption. When it's just in the roots, we tend not to see a lot of problems. Uh, the only way we really detect it is with x-rays. But on an oral exam, I tried to look at that first tooth behind the canine tooth. In fact, there's only three teeth behind the canine tooth on a cat. And on the x-ray, you can see that one little tooth there on the right-hand side of the x-ray is the third premolar. That's the one that is most commonly affected in cats. So I try to look at that tooth on exam. If I see any indication that that resorption is happening in the crown, that there's some crown loss or maybe gum tissues growing into those defects, that's where we see discomfort with these teeth. So we usually do extraction. If we're able to take out the entire root, that's terrific. Uh, cat I just worked on yesterday, two out of the three roots of one tooth I was able to take out. And on another tooth, it had the really resorbing root that wasn't able to easily lift out of the socket. So we're okay with letting that remain. 
We just make sure we take x-rays if there's no underlying infection, and then we follow up at the next dental procedure. So cats can be quite interesting with oral tumors as well. While squamous cell carcinoma is the most common type, either in the gingiva, which ends up affecting bone, like on this lower x-ray of the lower mandible, uh, underneath the tongue or in the tongue, which is not a great place, or even in the tonsils. It is the most common tumor in kitty cats. Unfortunately, since it is a malignant type growth, you need very wide margins. Once I get a mass that is already affecting the jaw and even crossing to the other jaw, sometimes we talk about taking the entire jaw, jaw out but that's even only if we've caught it early, before it reaches this stage with a lot of changes. The trouble is cats are even better at hiding things than dogs are. They will hide any signs, any problems of eating, any discomfort. I mean, that's how they do it. They hide it until they can't hide it anymore and it's already pretty severe. When they stop eating well, when they stop grooming well, that can be a sign that there's the oral pain due to the tumor. That's why even though with decreased vaccination protocols or increased intervals between vaccinations, it's actually very important to continue to get regular veterinary care for your cats, not only for tumors, but also the tooth resorptions and the stomatitis. There's a DNA, it's called base pause, that is now looking at checking out the genome in cat's mouths, and it can help alert you as to whether or not you should take them in for your visit. Because getting patients in for treatment can be challenging. If your cat or dog doesn't like going to the vet very well, you know what, I love going with medications that help relieve that anxiety, so ask your vet about that. It's called Fear Free. The other thing is dental treatment requires general anesthesia. I know there's a trend for uh, promoting some non-anesthesia dental cleanings, and that can clean off the crowns, but pardon the pun, it doesn't get to the root of the problem. So we have to be able to take x-rays. We have to be able to treat underneath the gum line for periodontal disease. And we want to protect the airway with an endotracheal tube like we have in this picture so we can keep debris from getting into the patient's lungs. If they're awake or sedated, Aerosolized bacteria, chunks of calculus can actually be, in, be inhaled. And of course, the most important thing is a complete treatment. So concerns for treatment, obviously the general anesthesia, and we see a lot of senior patients. Uh, as we look at these senior patients, this one, this guy's bubble gump. In fact, this was around October because he has on his duck costume. When we look at these senior patients, when we look at these small patients, we're gonna be doing customized protocols for their medications, using specific drugs, really looking at their body te temperature and making sure we manage other diseases. I do ask on a get asked on a regular basis, how are they gonna eat without their teeth? In fact, this guy didn't have most of his lower jaw because it was that bad. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes they have to learn a little bit especially with jaw changes, extractions, they usually do great with eating. In fact, they usually eat better. And of course, cost will always be an issue because we're able to provide better preoperative care, better anesthetic monitoring, x-rays and oral surgery. This can drive up the costs. Planning for it ahead of time, getting insurance for small breed dogs, you know, there's different ways of, of funding these care credits. We've even had some patients that come to the specialty office that make a GoFundMe page with cute little pictures and even pictures of the bad stuff and then how, he's how they're doing afterwards. You can be imaginative. Because some of those costs include the care that we provide these patients during their procedure. During these procedures, they must have that breathing tube, the endotracheal tube cuff. They must have IV catheter and fluids. So these are some things you can ask. Is this what my pet's getting? They need to be monitored. And we have multiple monitoring systems that check everything from blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, uh, the carbon monoxide coming out, the, the oxygen levels in the blood. We need good body warming units. 
because especially little older dogs, they get cold quicker and they'll also be wet. And a big part is pain management as well that I'll cover in just a little bit. Dental x-rays are not optional. We have got to take dental x-rays. There may be a few clinics out there that don't have dental x-rays now, but most of them do. So that's really, really important. If you know your pet has periodontal disease or issues or small jaw or concerns, you might see if there's a practice that has a board certified diplomate in America and there's a couple in South Africa too, in Cape Town, uh, in Europe and whatnot uh, for a different level of care or even find a clinic that's more comfortable with doing more advanced cases that they can do dental x-rays. We certainly really try to minimize the anesthetic time that these patients are under. And there are some that we even do in two separate procedures so they're not out for too long at one time. And then we monitor them very closely during the recovery time. So as we start out with these patients, we're definitely going to do preoperative blood work. Uh, seniors, we like to do kidney function. So we'll check out uh, your analysis. With the older ones, the chest and abdominal x-rays, blood pressure, wherever possible. And if we start seeing indications of issues, we're going to do some additional work. So this little dog had a SDMA of 15, which goes, oh, we might be on this low end of starting some kidney issues. Why don't we be careful and make sure we give plenty of fluids? In some cases, there may be such bad infection that antibiotics may be required. Now, this is not required in every case. And in fact, we try not to use antibiotics if we don't need to. But if they've got heart disease, kidney disease, and a lot of infection, we might want to go to those antibiotics. Here's my old dog, Buddy. We had to put him down, put him uh, down a couple months ago, but he, uh, he went through regular dental cleanings. His teeth weren't that great, but he did very well with it. There are some newer protocols where, especially with the smaller dogs, we do allow a small amount of food up to four hours prior to the procedure, especially if they have some needed medications. That way they tend to have a little bit less nausea, but we can also use anti-nausea medication as well. And we'll let water stay down until they're on the way to the clinic. So when we prep for the procedure, we like to think about using cocktails. Now, don't give your dog a martini. What that means is we like to use multimodal ways of pain management, sedation, we use everything. We put it into a general mix. So we'll wanna make sure that we have enough sedation and pain management. They're gonna be on IV catheter and fluids. We're gonna go ahead and induce them with an injection that helps make them fall asleep so we can get the endotracheal tube down, get them on oxygen, get them on their inhalant anesthetics, get the monitoring started and get everything going for the procedure. Now, one of those things I mentioned was pain. And this is actually from one of my veterinary talks, but I think it's quite, quite interesting. And this is a human tooth um, model. So oral and dental pain, if you've ever had a toothache, you know how excruciating it can be. It's kind of intriguing with teeth. They have certain fibers, nerve fibers, that can transmit many sensations, heat, cold, pressure, pain. But the cold that's applied to the tooth or the pressure that's applied to the nerve is read by your brain as pain. It's a very good self-preservation mode. So if your tooth nerve can feel cold getting through the tooth itself, something's not completely right. And in fact, it, I know some people are cold and heat sensitive, but I'm talking significant pain. And when you have pain, you go get help. So that is why pain management is so important to us before, during, and after. We wanna make sure we have, especially if we're doing any kind of surgery and pain of the, of, the process, of the disease itself, that we make these patients as comfortable as possible and back to function as quickly as possible. So we may consider going with some oral medication, sending something home before, something like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, Rimadyl, things like that, Carprofen. There's many out there. We might decide to go on it before the procedure to help with discomfort and pain and also decrease the, 
inflammation. We will be using injections preoperatively, right before and certainly during. And we do local blocks to help numb the areas that we'll be doing the dental work on. The dental blocks I absolutely love because they're going to be comfortable waking up, going home, and then you can start the pain medication again at home, and that will be a nice smooth transition. Now, in addition to medication, we always look at what else can we do to help keep the pain and inflammation decreased. I'll often recommend doing some type of cold compress on the surgery site. Now, if it's a two pound dog, you don't want a bag of peas. I like taking a washcloth, making it wet, wringing it out, putting it in the freezer, taking it out, letting it thaw just a little bit and using that soft cold compress on the surgical site. I've also begun using the, a CC loop. And we'll talk about that in just a minute that it helps provide additional relief from pain and inflammation and can help speed healing that can be done even before the procedure to help decrease the inflammation in the clinic in the post-operative -op recovery period, and then at home to help enhance healing and decrease pain. So that's why we look at non-pharmacy options to help with both acute or surgical pain and chronic pain management even. So certainly as we look at things from acupuncture, cold, cool compresses, things like this, what I've become much more familiar with lately is this targeted pulsed electromagnetic field. In the veterinary um, area, we have studies with post-surgical cases and with osteoarthritis, and we're looking at some dental cases as well. In the human field, this type of therapy has been used extensively, and I think it's a great translation to be able to use it with our pets as well. So basically, these loops delivers a field of pulsed electromagnetic field and nitric oxygen production is enhanced, the endothelial NO. This increases blood flow to the area, which can help with healing. It decreases or modulates some of these cytokines, some of these inflammatory molecules that while we want a little bit of inflammation when there's an initial insult, that's the body's host response. We don't want it becoming excessive and causing problems. So basically it's been shown to help decrease pain and swelling, edema, and help increase tissue repair. So these coils create a field and within this barrel shaped field, that's where the area to be treated needs to be. Usually there's a little switch you can put on and we go at least twice a day with the 15 minutes treatments. Sometimes I'll go up to four times a day if there's a lot of inflammation. And once it's gone through that 15 minute treatment, it, it turns off. So as we're looking at these patients, we know that caring for the patient is extremely important. We need to make sure that we know that these are older patients. Often they have concurrent disease. We're gonna be looking at preoperative testing on all ages. And if we find problems, we're gonna be looking at managing those cases before we go to surgery to stabilize them. And then we're certainly going to be looking at customizing the anesthesia, uh, the care during the procedure and even the pain protocols. So if your patient, if your pet has cardiac issues, the most common one is a heart murmur that shows that the heart valve is no longer functioning as well as it can be. At the very least, I like to have x-rays taken, chest x-rays, read, evaluated by a radiologist, not just by me. And there's also a blood test called ProBNP that we use quite frequently here. If either of those two are abnormal, ProBNP elevated, chest x-rays don't look that great, we will recommend getting an echo, an ultrasound, so we can see how severe the changes are in that heart. If there are severe enough changes, then we'll have medication treatment given until that patient is more stable. There's some that the heart murmur is there, but there's mineral changes of the heart. And we're okay at that point to go ahead with surgery. There are others that we need to have treated 
and have to have stabilized. And then you think, well, why would you be doing anesthesia on these patients? Well, if we don't treat the infection and inflammation in the mouth, it can make the heart even worse. So it's important for us, except in severe cases, to try to get this patient stabilized so we can treat the mouth as well. We then use special medications. We decrease fluids slightly. We monitor them very closely. We even have the owners count the resting respiration rates. How many times is your patient is your pet breathing when they're asleep? And watching that very closely for several weeks afterwards. Because if it st starts at about 18 to 20, but starts going up to 25 to 30, that shows that the heart's not as efficient as it should be, and we're starting to have problems. So resting respiration rate is a good, good thing to do at home for your heart patients. If we have renal patients, kidney issues, cat, older cats have quite a, quite a few of them have issues. We need to make sure they stay hydrated. We may bring them in for fluids for several days prior to the procedure, and they'll probably get an increased rate of fluids during the procedure. We'll use certain medications and avoid others to make sure that blood pressure is maintained. That's a very important aspect of the uh, kidney disease. Unless there's hypertension, then we have to watch that. And then we'll monitor for urine output. Now, you, you may be wondering that the little plush heart and kidney that I've been showing, there's actually a website that's iheartguts.com that you can buy just about any organ in a plush toy form. So it's just a fun sight, especially with Christmas coming up. How about those diabetic pets? And we have quite a few because as we get the fat cats and the fat dogs, diabetes increases. You get a overweight animal with periodontal disease and that can make, make it very difficult to manage and regulate the diabetes with the chronic inflammation in the mouth. With those patients, we tend to go with a half dose of the, their morning insulin, but allow that small amount of food. And then we check glucose before, during, and after the procedure. If it happens to drop, we can give glucose. That's usually not a big issue because stress tends to increase uh, blood glucose. We certainly like using any kind of anxiety medication for these patients to keep them from being too anxious. When they return home, we do allow small meals. We don't want them to eat too much at a time after anesthesia, as they can become nauseated. And then we have them return to regular insulin levels. Now, one thing about diabetics, especially cats, once you get that inflammation cleared up in the oral cavity, sometimes they need less insulin to regulate their diabetes. And I've even had stories told to me from other veterinarians where their diabetic cats could maintain on diet only, did not need insulin after that. So diabetes and periodontal disease are, are co coexist. In fact, diabetes makes periodontal disease worse. So you got to work with both. When we get ready for discharge, in fact, I'm going to the step before discharge, we call owners uh, when they're getting their first injection, we call them when we've got all the x-rays because we get a lot of surprises during that time. We let them know what's updated. Then we call them when they go into recovery to set up time for discharge. We watch them very closely during the post-operative period. If they seem uncomfortable at all, we give them more pain medication. We make sure that they're they're awake, they're waking up nicely, body temperature's okay, and even that they're producing urine. At discharge, we'll often show photos and x-rays to our clients. We'll give them the pain medication. We'll talk about antibiotics for some of the cases. A lot of times if we've had oral procedures, uh, any kind of surgery, we'll have them soften the food. Now I usually just have them soften the kibble so they don't change too much of the diet. We don't want having any dietary issues. And sometimes they even need to go home with cone of shame. This was a little puppy who had been attacked by another dog and we had to do quite a bit of, of um, restoration there, uh, but she, she did really, really well. We also then set up a time that we can follow up and make sure everything went well. So that first night, we let people know they're gonna be a little more vocal. They may seem a little disoriented, even a little drunk. 
Um, and that, that's okay. I mean, that, that, that post anesthesia, it's not typically too much related to pain or discomfort as it is to a little bit of confusion, maybe. So the first few days, especially with the older ones, they may be a little, a little slower. They may not eat as well, uh, but that typically within a day or so is doing much better. Now they may not be drinking as much water. In fact, I should say not drinking as much, but as long as they're urinating okay, they're getting more water in that soft food and they got additional fluids in their IV fluids. And occasionally due to the endotracheal tube, there may be a mild cough, but most of these things subside after a day or two. Like I said, that two week visit is one of our favorite appointments. We'll examine the sites, make sure that everything's healing well. Most of the sutures we use dissolve on their own. But this is when we find out how much better these patients feel after having getting the dental work done. We'll get them back to their regular diet. We'll discuss home care, what's appropriate, and schedule the next procedure. Now, if the mouth is great, we might do that in 12 months. If we had periodontal disease and had to do some special procedures, I might want to see them back in six months to make sure everything's going okay or maybe nine months. So we don't let it get back to that stage four, or stage three. So as pet owners, and I know I'm not the best about brushing my cat's own, my own cat's teeth, but there are things we can do. It's important to have regular examinations at your veterinary. It's important to have regular dental cleaning under general anesthesia, and we can do home care. There's a site called the Veterinary Oral Health Council that has a listing of products that have done some testing that meet standards of preventing tartar and plaque, okay? Now that's not to say that a, a product that's not on this site is no good, just that these are the ones that have done some of the research. The best overall will always be regular brushing, effective brushing, but that can be challenging in some patients. Uh, dental wipes can be used if you can't do a full brushing. Dental diets can help decrease some of that plaque and tartar accumulation. S appropriate shoes may work, solutions and gels. So the home care is definitely brushing. And in fact, we'll see if this works. When we get our recheck in, we like to do a toothpaste taste test and let the dog choose the toothpaste. You notice I said dog. Um, I haven't had too many cats who will participate in a toothpaste taste test, but let them choose their favorite flavor. Start out slow and gradually. Penny, you lost your sound. Oh, oh, hold on. Let me try this again. Was it just at that video? Heidi. Your microphone's muted. There we go. Is that better? Can you hear me now? I'm not sure if you can hear me right now, but I can see that I'm off mute. Yep, you're good so, now. Okay, so dental wipes are another thing I do. I think when I did the video, I think it uh, changed, changed the sound system. So dental wipes, and this is sometimes how I'll approach for brushing too, especially initially, come from behind, particularly on cats and small dogs. Scratch their ears, rub the face, and then gradually use the wipes and try to rub on the teeth as you pull back the lips. Shoes can be very good as long as they're bendable, compressible. You make sure the dog's chewing it correctly, not swallowing whole pieces. Thumbnail can press into it. But hard objects, bones, antlers, huge meaty bones, things like that, um, we should have a sign that says, thank you for supporting our dental practice because they will break teeth. Oh my goodness. So please be aware what you give to your dog to chew. And if they go outside and chew rocks and things like that, look at their teeth on a regular basis. Look for either those worn or fractured teeth or even the purple teeth. That shows that a tooth is non-vital, the pulp is dead. The key is treating them from a young age, making sure we go throughout those life cycles, those life stages, and keep the teeth healthy, healthy so when they are older, we won't have to do as much. Do good home care, appropriate treats, yearly exams, 
and we can help get some pretty healthy mouths out there. <laughs>